brothers and sisters, is it okay if I begin with a joke? <laughs> Pastor Zenders taught me well. Uh, the joke has to, first of all, I have to say, it's twice as old as I am. That would make it 164 plus. Actually, the first time it appeared in print was in a New York magazine 167 years ago. Well, I am slow. I kind of get into this joke slowly. And a few years ago, I, I got it. Now, I don't know if you know the joke or not. You probably do. Everybody here knows jokes. But it's the joke about why did the chicken cross the road? Does everyone know that joke? I see a few. Let's see your hands. If you, if you know the joke, why the chicken cross the road? Some of you are old enough. All right. Okay, well, anyway, there are a whole variety of answers. By the way, this is all relevant. <laughs> it, really, it really has something to do with the message today. Sometimes jokes don't have that kind of connection, but this does, hopefully. By the end of the sermon, you'll see what the connection was. Anyway, uh, why did the chicken cross the road? Suggested answers. There's one from a grandpa, and so I fit this one perfectly. The grandpa answered the question, why did the chicken cross the road? In my day, he said, we didn't ask why the chicken crossed the road. Somebody told us. The chicken crossed the road to get to the other side. And that was good enough for us. Okay, that shows respect for authority. That's why nobody really knows that anymore. There's not all that much respect for authority anymore. But in my, you know, 80 some years ago, there was respect for authority. Anyway, the next person's suggested answer to this question comes from Albert Einstein. And Albert Einstein, in response to why did the chicken cross the road, said, did the chicken cross the road, really? Or did the road move beneath the chicken? You know, Albert Einstein with relativity and all of that stuff. Okay. You've got to really know the background of these individuals to get the joke. Sir Isaac Newton, he had something to do about the laws of motion. Sir Isaac Newton said this in answer to the question. Chickens at rest tend to stay at rest. Chickens who are in motion tend to cross the road. <laughs> Good answer, Isaac. Uh, this comes from a nun, you know, a, a sister. Uh, the sister, in answer to the question, why did chickens cross the road, said, it was a habit. <laughs> Hamlet, Shakespeare's Hamlet, to be or not to be, that's the question. What did Hamlet say to the question? Why did the chicken cross the road, Hamlet? That is not the question. <laughs> OK, a uh, couple more. John Donne, he's a famous Scottish pastor and poet. And uh, Father John wrote that wonderful sonnet, For Whom the Bell Tolls, and then finally it tolleth for thee. OK, what did Father John say? The, in answer to the question, why did the chicken cross the road, Father John? It crosseth for thee. <laughs> and finally, the inimitable Colonel Sanders. If anybody <laughs> would know about chickens, Colonel Sanders would. So, Colonel, can you please tell me, why did the chicken cross the road? Did I miss one? <laughs> well, all that aside, but it is relevant, because now there's a book, a book written by a Brian D. McLaren. And the book takes off from this particular joke. And it's a serious book. The title is, Why Did Jesus, Moses, the Buddha, and Mohammed Cross the Road? OK, so you can kind of see there's something serious going on here. And that's what we're going to try to get into. Now, the book is, what did I say here, 275 pages long. Uh, I don't think we're going to cover all that today. So I'm going to stick with Jesus. Is that OK with a congregation here? We stick with you. Why did Jesus cross the road? And you all know that all scripture points to Jesus. If we've learned anything through Pastor Scott, he's shown us over and over again, especially in that Easter pericope 
about uh, the Emmaus disciples and they meet Jesus on the road and he shows them in the scriptures everything pertaining to himself. Jesus is the point of scripture. So I can take a look quickly and you can put the first one on the screen there of Exodus. Uh, and we are going to find Jesus there. Now, you may not be able to read that, but uh, you heard it before, and, and I'll remind you of some of the things that uh, occur there. Why did Jesus cross the road? According to this text, the first thing that we see Jesus up to, it says the Lord, and that's just another word, in a sense, for Jesus. In the New Testament, Jesus is called by Thomas, my Lord and my God. At the end of this lesson, it says, Your right hand, Lord, shattered the enemy. Jesus is the Lord who comes in as a warrior. A warrior. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army is hurled into the sea. He's a wonderful rescuer of God's people from the threat of its enemies. Pharaoh represents the enemies, and for us that will finally mean not just a single person like a Pharaoh, but sin and death and the devil. And the mighty warrior, Jesus, casts it down, is the victorious Lord. He crosses the road, that is, the Red Sea here, with his people to bring them into a safe place. What a wonderful message. And I guess you'd have to say there's nothing very chicken about this Jesus. He's a whitey warrior. Okay, the next slide. Having to do, I'm going to go to the gospel next, Matthew's gospel. And it's a well-known story, the story of Jesus praying in Gethsemane. Now, again, Gethsemane, you know, is a garden. The garden of Gethsemane. And Gethsemane means olive press, where the olives are squeezed out and the oil extracted. So it's in this garden that we find Jesus praying. But where is he coming from? We'll go back to the Old Testament. There is another garden. It's called Eden, Garden of Paradise. And Jesus crosses from the Garden of Paradise to the Garden of Gethsemane, from all the wonderful peace and harmony and love that you found originally in the Garden of Eden. He passes across that road to go into Gethsemane, the place where the olives are pressed out, where life is pressed out. And he turns to prayer. When we're up against it, when our backs are against the wall, we really learn how to pray, don't we? To pray really from our hearts. And that's the picture you have of Jesus here in this gospel. He's praying five times the word prayer is used. And when it describes him in prayer, look at the words that describe Jesus. He's sorrowful and troubled and overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He's on his face. He's crying out, my father, my father. Now, is this a weak Jesus? Well, it sure would say that to me. He seems to be struggling. He's struggling with the circumstances of his life. What's going to happen? This is horrendous. What I'm facing is unbearable when you think of it. So he turns to his father, cries out in prayer. Three times disciples go to sleep. Their eyes are heavy. They don't watch with him. And he gets up and he warns them, watch with me, watch with me, pray with me. They go to sleep. But he's crying out in sorrow to his father. And what happens at the end? The end, it says, look, the hour has come. The hour when he's going to die. And the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Where is Jesus at now? As he struggled through the pain and the, the, the anticipation of what he's facing. And the father keeps saying, son, it's what we have to do. We have to do this. It's for the sake of our people. It's for the sake of salvation. It's for the sake of you being a mighty warrior, but you're going to be a different kind of a mighty warrior. 
You're going to lay down your power and save our people from their sins. And so Jesus, in the strength of that expectation, stands up and faces the enemy head on. Okay, Jesus is transformed through prayer into a person who can face reality, face it head on with confidence. Okay, the final lesson from Philippians chapter 2. I, I, I call this one uh, kind of a round-trip ticket for Jesus. You know, the, the lesson begins, it, it's actually a hymn of two stanzas, and the hymn is divided, the two stanzas are kind of divided by the word therefore. You've heard many, many times that word therefore, how important it is. There's something that goes before, and therefore something follows. Well, it's a, it's a round-trip ticket, you know, the first part of the ticket. Where does Jesus start from? He starts from heaven. He's God. But he lays that privileged situation, like the Garden of Eden thing. He lays the privilege of being God aside. Lays it down so that he can join sinful humanity. And he, he's willing to go to the cross. He's willing to endure the pain. He's willing to bear the consequences of our sin. But then it said, therefore, God is also highly exalted him and given him a name, a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, things in heaven, things on earth, things under the earth, to the glory, that is his humility again, to the glory of God the Father. So he the round-trip ticket takes him from heaven. He humbly lays it aside, suffers for humankind, and then is raised up by the glory of the Father. And he receives that glory and then says, it's for the glory of the Father. Humble, humble Jesus. Yeah, chicken, who knows? Who knows? Let's try to discover more about this chicken thing. How willing are we, you and I, to be identified with this chicken crossing the road, Jesus? To have the same mindset, as Paul says in Philippians. Have this mindset, which was in Christ Jesus. You should have this. Do we have that kind of a mindset? You know, in life, we struggle. I just heard some, it'll be included in the prayers this morning. Pastor Justin's father-in-law. The cancer that has returned is now indicated to be terminal. Okay, a lot of trials, a lot of struggle in this life, as Jesus had struggled. And where do we turn when we have such struggles? We turn in prayer. We turn in prayer to Jesus. But what kind of Jesus do we confront? What kind of Jesus comes to us when we turn to him? There have been three suggested answers in this book, I'm borrowing. And it's basically, the first two, they have a biblical aspect to them, but it's actually some kind of distortion of the biblical message. And the third one is, hopefully, according to him, and I, I think he's right on this, is a truer representative, a representation of the Jesus, the real Jesus of Scripture. The first uh, example is this, a strong but hostile Jesus. Strong but hostile image of who he is. So strong would indicate this Jesus really stands for God. He stands for God and the things of God. And that would certainly be, you know, God is love and all of that. But God is also holy. And when it comes right down to it, the holiness of God seems to be so powerful for, for this approach that if you don't express adequate holiness, the God of love is not going to come to you because the God of love is a holy God and he expects that kind of you know, goodness in you if you're going to experience his love. And so if you don't measure up, if you don't color inside uh, the, the lines, he's angry. So many, many people out there, and you know some and maybe you were one of them at one time, Maybe a little bit still. When things are going badly, you get angry 
because you feel God is angry at me. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm angry at God. He can take it and you know what he can do with it. I don't love this God. He's always picking on me. I can't please him no matter what I do. So why even bother? A hostile understanding of who God is. The second, also somewhat based in scripture, is just the polar opposite of that. A weak but benign image of God. That Jesus gives us a weak, he kind of, you know, tests the wind. Where is the wind coming from in this uh, congregation today? Oh, 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 this is where they're coming from. And I'll give them basically what they want to hear. And so we don't make any waves, we don't rock any boats. It's just all kind of wonderful, loving, and peaceful, and friendly. We just all get along, don't we? But there's no, no real standing for anything. This God is kind of useless. You know, if, if we're just going to have a God who reflects the culture, why even bother with God? Just reflect the culture. And we, we do a pretty good job here in Ann Arbor of reflecting the culture. That we don't need God to help us with that. So let's just do it. So this God is kind of irrelevant. But he sounds on the surface, because you can't stand this hostile God, this is a better God. Wouldn't you rather have, be friends with this God than that other one? Well, finally, the third one, which I think is really the picture we want to have of God. He's a strong God. He's the, the warrior, but he's benevolent. He's compassionate. He takes his strength and his power and doesn't use it against us, doesn't use it in a hostile way or in a plainly neutral way. He uses it by coming to us and laying his life down for us. He's willing to surrender. You know, the two-way uh, ticket. He lays his life down for us and then receives it again. Well, that's where I'm at. But during a 30-year period of ministry here in Ann Arbor, I've had the opportunity to observe three different approaches to representing Christ actually worked out in a very practical and sensitive area. Okay, this is where the rubber hits the road. This is where, are we chickens doing this, or are we doing that? A very practical, and when I use the word, you see that it's practical, and very sensitive, and you also recognize how sensitive this topic is, and why, Ted, why are you going there? This is ridiculous. Well, if the message of Jesus is supposed to be strong, yet benevolent and kind, somehow we got to put this all together. And the topic is, Where are we at on the pro-life or pro-choice approach to abortion? I said the word. Abortion. Where are we at? There's the pro-life side to all of this, and there's the pro-choice side to all of that. And it's practical, because we face it every day, and it's sensitive. It's not just an easy issue to address. I've tried to address it in a a blog that I wrote some some weeks ago, and you can access it. It's it's called The Vision Extended. Uh, Pastor Scott had preached on on, uh, Cornelius and Peter and the vision of food and, you know, do you eat this food or do you not eat this food? And the the vision extended for Peter, his, his, how he he behaved. And I wrote in a, a blog, Extended vision. Do we have to extend our vision as to how we relate to all of this? Well, anyway, that's in the blog, and kind of a a summary of that blog is on the screen there. This is taken from, this is amazing. This was an article in the Ann Arbor News on 9-11, 1994. I figured out that's seven years before the 9-11 we know so well. But here in the Sunday newspaper, on 9-11, 1994, appeared this, this uh, article. And uh, I don't know if you can read it there, but it says, foes on abortion issue, sit down to talk it over. 
In a remarkable meeting, abortion foes share a restaurant table and their views of where they stand. On the left is a picture of Robin Menon, the director at that time of Planned Parenthood. I think she's now with the Lord, but that's in the blog. And I could never say for sure, who knows? But I think that's where she is. But she directed Planned Parenthood. Read it in the blog. On the other side is a picture of me. And there it says, well, first of all, it says under, under Robin, I would be proud and happy to stand next to you in front of the Michigan legislature on adoption. On adoption. She's kind of saying, you know, I'm really not sold out to this abortion thing. I think it's a necessary thing, but basically, I'm more for adoption. Will you go with me to the legislature? And I'll stand there with you, and we'll advocate for adoption, better laws regulating adoption. On the other side, under the picture of me, it says, there's something very human about talking, something we lose of our humanity when we stop talking. I read that when I dug this thing up. I said, wow, that was good, Ted. <laughs> I wish I would really live that as strongly as those words would indicate. But that's what the reporter picked up. I know I said that. But I say, I feel kind of sheepish now. So, people who know me say, wow, is that the way it's always been in your life, Ted? Uh, no. uh, I'm working on it. I'm working at it. Well, anyway, that's uh, kind of the summary of the, of the Robin Menon thing. But the story of Planned Parenthood doesn't end there. It continues with another person who's involved at, at Planned Parenthood. He's a, he's a really brilliant guy. I'll call him Kearney. His name is something else but Kearney. Uh, and Kearney is always there. He's, I'll tell you a few things about Kearney. He's, I think he was born into a Roman Catholic family. Uh, the last of 13 children. His father was an alcoholic, abusive to his mother, to the kids, and to Bert. And uh, Kearney was, was, was obviously not happy. He was not particularly happy with uh, the, 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 the Catholic Church and what, what the Catholic Church taught about birth control and about abortion. This didn't make any sense to him at all. It just caused him a lot of grief, these laws. And so he, he turned absolutely against the church. And now he spends his uh, retirement years, he's retired now, uh, sociology uh, professor at one time. But, but he, he spends his time doing various things, but he's often at Planned Parenthood when there's any kind of a thing going on uh, by pro-life people. And he'll be there honking his horn, disturbing the, any kind of attempt we might be making to, to get engaged with the women and men coming in there. And, uh, okay, he doesn't like what we're doing. And you can put the next uh, signs up there now. Uh, this is a strange sign. The signs are genuine. Those are signs such as we really carry. But the four people, there are four Lutherans. This never occurred like that. There were never... We must have posed. I can't remember why we went out there, but it was a nice spring day, and maybe someone said, well, why don't we get a picture of us doing this, and maybe that can help in our local churches, you know, show, you know, one of the things that can be done in order to protest this, this, this stuff. And it's, it, we, we stand there and we pray and we carry some signs. And, and the sign that I'm carrying says, Lord Jesus, do not hold this sin against them. Bernie, they say Bernie, Kearney didn't like that sign. He didn't like any of the signs. All of these signs reminded him of God. All these signs reminded him of things he didn't like. And he was angry. And he opposed us bitterly. Well, one day, it was in the winter. It was a day like this, maybe. Not real cold, but there was snow on the ground. There was ice on the ground, half. And my wife was leading the singing. We were gathered in a circle. And all of a sudden, I'm opposite her. I see her beginning to fall. And I... I rush over there, but I can't catch her. She lands flat on her face. It was the strangest fall, but just right on her face. I go run over there and turn her over, and she's bleeding from the nose, 
glasses broken, eyes, you know, it's bleeding under the eye, I think, from the glasses. And, but you know what happened? This was the amazing thing. Somebody crossed the line at that point. And there was a clear line. The line that said, here is the line for uh, the, the people who believe in free speech. We were on that side of the line. On the other side of the line was Kearney. No trespassing. So, uh, and the police had put that on. Uh, we had been in jail and stuff like that. They, they were tired of us being there, and they, they drew a line and said, if you're on this side, you can exercise your free speech. If you're on the other side, you're trespassing, and you will go to jail, and you will go there for a long period of time. So we were being pretty careful. Okay. So Lois falls on the ground, my wife. I'm over there helping her. And all of a sudden, Kearney is there with a cell phone in hand. He says, should I call 911? He wasn't asking to call the police. He was asking to call the ambulance to help her. He somehow had seen what had happened, and he crossed the line to us, and something happened to me that day. There's a humanity in this man that had been hidden. Where was it all the while? I didn't see it. But in the moment of human need, the human Kearney was manifested, and I began to think. I thought deeply about this. I said, Ted, there's something to be learned here. Well, I don't go there anymore except once a year. And I go there uh, usually on the Roe v. Wade, so last month about this time of the year. Uh, we were there again. And Kearney is there. He's still doing the same thing. I haven't been out there for, except once a year for, for this event. And after the hours, oh, and it was cold and windy. It was a terrible day. But okay, everybody breaks up after we're done. And I walk over to that line. And I said, Kearney, can I get my hug? I needed a hug. He had given me a hug at Robin's funeral. I'd attended Robin's funeral. It's all in the block. I'd attended Robin's funeral. And I just, well, when it was all over, that funeral was over, he came up to me and I came up. We hugged each other. I so appreciate your being here, he said. Well, I appreciate your having been there when Lois fell. We still had our respective positions. We were strong in our positions. But there was something happening, something happening. So on this particular, just a few weeks ago, I go over to that line. I said, Bernie, I need my hug. I need my hug. He rolls down his window. It's too cold, he says. <laughs> I said, well, can I come over to you? Can I cross the line? He gets his cell phone. I got to check with authorities, he says. So he, he's on his cell. And then he says, come on over. So I walk over. And while I'm walking over, he gets out of his car. And when I get to him, we end up in a strong embrace. I still carry the same sign. I still have the same strong position on pro-life, but something is happening, and it's on the way to becoming another Robin Menon story. I said, Kearney, let's go off to Starbucks one of these days. I want to hear your story. I don't know your whole story. I know parts of it. I have snippets of it. But in order to understand you, I need to hear your story. You have to hear my story. Just listen. Listen to one another. But I think it's in that listening, sympathetically, in our pain to one another, that God is at work. Okay, now I'm going to make a big leap. I'm going to talk about the Lord's Supper. But is it really a big leap? Is it really a big leap at this point to talk about the Lord's Supper? Who is present in the Lord's Supper? Jesus. If we have these different understandings of the image of Jesus that we spoke of earlier, then if Jesus is present in the Lord's Supper, then there's a potential for this distorted image or proper image to come out in our understanding of the Lord's Supper. And isn't it true that many people have a picture of the Jesus in the Lord's Supper as one who's really concerned about the line? Who's on the inside of that line and who's on the outside of that line? Who dare cross over and receive the precious body and blood of Jesus and whom is Jesus angry with 
because you're not living up to God's word. So please live up to God's word, and then you're welcome. Meanwhile, there should be a, a line here that you should not cross over. Well, that's the hostile Jesus applied to the Lord's Supper. And then, of course, there's the other Jesus, the one who doesn't stand for anything. Oh, come on, it doesn't make any difference. Just, just we're all friends here, you know? And you can think what you are, what you, what you want, you can live the way you want, but we will be friends. We tolerate each other. We are good for each other. Who needs that Lord's Supper? Well, the real Lord's Supper is the strong Jesus who really stands for something. But what he stands for most of all is that he wants to come across that line and meet us in our need, where we are struggling, where we need the help and the encouragement of a strong God, a strong Jesus, but one who's willing to sacrifice himself in order to lift us up. Now that brings me to my last point. And that has to do with my ministry at St. Luke. I think one of the most important things I do at St. Luke is to bring the Eucharist to people who can't come. It's like putting the Eucharist on the road, you know, on the road. And Jesus is crossing barriers. There are barriers that people have to receiving, you know, and not of their own making. They want to receive, but they can't come. Well, there, is there anybody who will come to them? Hopefully we are a church. Hopefully we are a church who will go to the people where there's a need. Well, we'll go down that road. Well, the ancient church has a name for that for that ministry. It's called the ministry of the last rites. You know, and it often has to do with anointing with oil, but it also has to do with kind of a last opportunity to receive the Lord's Supper. And the name for that was the viaticum, or the kibus viatorum. I use the Latin words so you got something new to hang on. You know, you'll hear viatorum, the viaticum, the viaticum the last rites, or the kibos, the food for travelers. These are people who are taking the last turn in the bend of their life. Very likely the last time that they have an opportunity to receive the Lord's presence in this special way. The Lord who gave everything for us and now is extending his hand in this sacrament says, my brother, my sister, I want to help you through this difficult, difficult. I know I was in this struggle, and now I see you in this struggle, and I will not let you be alone. I will be with you. And so he ushers us across the line, and it's my opportunity, my privilege, to be in that kind of a ministry. And shortly before he died, it was just about a month ago, I received the call, and you know, things were looking very much like uh, Ron was turning the page there and going around the stretch for the last time. And I was out there. This is not the exact picture of that occasion. This was maybe just a few days before when his uh, uh, granddaughter-in-law-to-be uh, was baptized. And I was blessing him uh, before leaving, just blessing him. But then when I did, a few days later, go back, and brought him the Lord's Supper, the kibbutz viatorum, the, the food for travelers. He knew why he wanted me to come. He was taking that last trip around after having prophesied it in his old last church service here, last sermon, a couple of months before, first Wednesday in Advent. There it was. And there you have a picture, I think, of where we want to be, where we want to be, as we travel the road of life. We want Jesus on that road with us. We want the Jesus who came from Eden to our Gethsemanes and joins us there with all the love he can possibly express and all the power that's in him is now focused in surrendering his life so that we can receive life. That's the story, and that's the story for you as well. We're always on that road. We're on the road towards death. Every week, we're one week closer 
to that day. This is not morbid talk. This is glorious talk because it's the reality, a reality we don't have to run from, a reality we can look at in the face because Jesus is on that road with us. He crossed the road from eternity to time. And now he ushers us from time into eternity. And I'd ask you to pray with me. I'm going to pray the last stanza of, of a hymn that was both a favorite for, for Pastor Zender and for me, but it expresses this so wonderfully. Would you pray with me? Lord, let at last thine angels come to Abram's bosom Bear me home, that I may die unfearing. And in its narrow chamber keep my body safe in peaceful sleep until thy reappearing. And then from death awaken me, that these mine eyes with joy may see, may see, O Son of God, Thy glorious face, my Savior, and my fount of grace, Lord Jesus Christ. My prayer attend, my prayer attend, and I will praise thee without. And all God's people said, Amen.